So hello and welcome to everybody that is tuning in to Incestaware's August Outspoken Discussion Series event with author and sibling sexual abuse expert Brad Watts. Um, I'm Susanna Saza, I'm the founder and co-director of Incestaware. And I am always so thrilled to know that people are interested in learning about incest abuse and prevention. So whether you know, you're here live on this Zoom discussion or if you're watching this recording on our YouTube channel, um, we wanna welcome you. Our outspoken talks happen monthly and we feature a whole bunch of people, activists, experts, healers, um, and others who have some interest and expertise in ending incest. So we hope that our guests will inspire you and educate you and bring us all together around this really, really important issue. So Incest Aware is the organization that pulls together these uh, discussions. We were founded last year and our mission is to end incest abuse, raise awareness, support survivors and inspire leaders. So we want to create here for the first time a national community where survivors and those who care about us are heard, believed and supported. Um, really, really important mission that we have. So if you want more information on us or you want info and resources, we have a uh, website, incestaware.org. We have e-news and you can connect with our Facebook community through there as well. So in today's session, we're gonna be talking with Brad Watts, who is an author and expert on the topic of sibling sexual abuse. So today or tonight, wherever you are, uh, Brad will provide his perspectives on one of the most hidden and misunderstood forms of incest, um, sibling sexual abuse, and help all of us understand what we can do to prevent it and support survivors. So I'm excited to be joined today by my co-host for this event, um, my fellow Incest Aware board member and collaborator, Jane Epstein. Jane Epstein, excuse me. Jane, if you can... Um, say hello and unmute yourself so people can see you because otherwise you won't pop up on the screen. Hello everyone. Uh, Brad, thank you so much for being here. And Suzanne, thank you so much for coordinating this because as you know, this is a passion for me. So thank you very much for your time guys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shane is one of my favorite people. Um, she's an advocate and educator at Complicated Courage, which you can explore at complicatedcourage.com. Her passion and her work and life mission are to bring awareness of sibling sexual abuse, which as we know is a largely ignored segment of sexual abuse. And she also is really concerned, I think this is so important about making body safety conversations between parents and children and everyday conversations. That's a fantastic mission. So I'm so glad, Jane, you are here. Thank you for having me. And, and finally, um, I, I wanna take a moment here to uh, introduce you to our guests, tell you a little bit about them. So Brad is the author of Sibling Sexual Abuse, A Guide for Confronting America's Silent Epidemic, which is this book, it's available on Amazon. I have a copy. Uh, it's not as marked up as Jane's copy, but <laughs> what is getting there. Um, Brad is a, a licensed professional counselor, and he's also a certified sex offender treatment provider. And he specializes in working with families where sibling sexual abuse has happened. Brad conducts trainings with communities and groups about how to recognize and respond to incidents of sibling sexual abuse. He lives in Virginia with his wife and son, and you can learn more about him at bradwattslpc.com. So after all of that, Brad, hello, welcome. So glad you are here. Thanks, Suzanne. I really appreciate you having me on. Thanks for that great intro. I appreciate it. Mm. Well, we are just, we're thrilled. I have been trying to get to Brad for quite some time and he, he was, he was, uh, available and interested in doing this, this uh, session. So I'm really, really excited about that. So Brad, if you could tell us how you got started in this field, because I think you would probably agree that none of us grows up wanting to be an expert in sibling sexual sure. abuse. Somehow you made your way here. Sure. How did you come to be interested in this topic? And why now at a time when so many other people are not talking about it? Yeah, that's a great question, Suzanne. And, and 
you know, this is something, you know, a few years back, I, I never would have dreamed I'd be doing and, and interested in. But for me, it started in grad school. Uh, I was taking classes, I had an amazing professor at the school I was at in, in East Tennessee. And she would talk about her, her love and interest in, in working with, with uh, just adolescent sexual offenders. And, and so I used to just think, you know, there's no way, you know, you know why would you enjoy that? And, and just thinking out of all the, the fields in, in mental health that I was training to, to work in, I, I could never, you know, work with that population. And, you know, she and I would talk, I would ask the questions like, hey, did they ever try and, you know, abuse you, you grab you, you know, you know, you know our, I generally was concerned for her safety, you know, and I would, I would ask her questions. She'd be like, Brad, no, no, you know, it wasn't like that. You know, I enjoyed it. She would talk about why. I was like, okay, but I can never do that. And, you know, kind of went forward. And so kind of fast forward, uh, my, my wife now, who's my girlfriend at the time, uh, we moved up to Virginia. She's been going to VCU to grad school. And so I came up without a job. And so I interviewed at, at uh, you know, where I'm at now. And, you know, they said, hey, yeah, you know, we, we'd love to bring you on, but how do you feel about working with, with what we call as our TSA population, which means treatment for sexually acting out youth. And so I was like, well, you know, I don't necessarily really want to do that, but I thought about my professor. And I was like, well, you know, I'll give it a shot. She really liked it. And you know, they're gonna, gonna let me ease into it. And so that started everything five years ago, five plus years ago. And, you know, as I got involved in it, I had, had a great mentor, two great mentors um, that I worked with and, and, you know, saw certain patterns, enjoyed working with the kids, obviously would run, run into kinds of uh, uh, different kinds of issues, you know, you're, that you just kind of, you know, feeling about working with sexual offenders, you know, I would work through some of those and, you know, learn more and more. And I started, you know, under the super, under my supervisor and worked on a project where I wrote uh, basically a, a family therapy treatment book, you know, for uh, sibling sexual abusers. So I took that back to my alma mater and to, to VCU in, in Richmond, and I presented that, you know, these conferences that they had. And, you know, was, was kind of educating on it. And, uh, and you know, I was struck by after I gave the presentations, I would have all these people come up and just kind of share their story, either their own story or in a lot of cases, people that they know. And, you know, that happened probably on three different occasions in multiple states. And so I was, I was scratching my hands like, this is crazy. You know, I mean, no one ever talks about this. And, you know, I've seen it in my work. Uh, with, with the kids, uh, with my clients, and, and it just kept coming up and coming up and coming up, up. and it was just something that, that I looked at and kind of wanted to do more research and, and, and write, um, you know, I went to some presentations, heard different things, uh, you know, about sibling sexual abuse or about adolescent abuse, and that led me, you know, leading into uh, sibling sexual abuse more and more, and then, you know, I was just struck with parents, and that's, you know, where I was kind of looking at, looking through that, that angle is they, they have nothing to deal with this, that there's no help, there's no support. Uh, you and I have talked about this, and Jane, we've talked about this, uh, and the fact that you know, if, whatever the, the life circumstance, so if, if I'm diagnosed with cancer, if I have, you know, other kinds of, of issues, we, we can talk and, and post to our friends, we're like, hey, where can I go? You know, you can reach out for support, but there's this culture of silence within sibling sexual abuse. And that's what it has caused so much of the, the problems is, is that culture of silence. So that was something I wanted to address. That's why I wrote the book. But just seeing more and more that, that this is, like the book says, you know, it's a silent epidemic, but it's just so far reaching. And, uh, and, and there just isn't that support, one, for survivors, as, as we know, and particularly for families and for parents. And then also, you know, from, from my aspect, what I've been working in is the importance to get, you know, adolescent offenders in treatment um, and address it as opposed to letting this go on and, and more and more people, you know, being abused and hurt, family shattered. And, and so that's what's led me into this and, and, you know, why I feel like it's so important that 
this is really, in, in my mind, uh, kind of one of the last things in our society that's taboo, that we just don't talk about, that we keep it in-house, sweep it under the rug, you know, but we, we need to talk about it. That's the whole premise of the book. I'm going to ask you the next question. Thank you for that. If you're an adult and you walk in on some form of touching or other activity between kids, what is the best way to react? What should adults do? Do all that they can. And this is easy to say and hard to do um, is to remain calm and, and really ask some questions, you know, with, with the kids. So it could be, it could depend on, you know, what you see you know, as far as what level, but, you know, action, you know, needs to be taken, you know, depending on, on what the level is, but, but it's really communicating with those kids and asking some good open-ended questions about what's the history, what's going on, um, you know, really trying to, to parse out whether, are they playing doctor, you know, and, and something that would be more of a, a typical, you know, uh, curiosity kind of thing, or is it abuse? And, and really going from there. And, and uh, you know, I would encourage people, you know, not to be afraid to get, you know, therapists involved, you know, um, within your community to, to reach out um, that, that specialize in this. And, that, you know, people like, like me and, and others, we're happy to answer questions and, and try and clarify things, um, but, but to get help. That is such a good, um, such a good point. I mean, I'm often asked when I give talks about whether or not, you know, children are just, quote, exploring when there's sexual activity between them. Um, I'm also asked sort of tongue in cheek whether calling it abuse is sort of an overreaction. Yeah. Um, and for people who are not quite sure what the difference might be, there's sort of this need to draw a line. What is abuse? What is exploring? So what do you think about this? I mean, is there any sexual activity between kids truly exploring? And if it is, you know, how do we tell the difference between exploration and harmful abuse? Are there yeah. some qualities? Are there some, is there some diagnosis? If you could just talk about that for me. Yeah, really, it, it all comes down to what's the motivation, right? And, and so I'll, I'll go to that here in a minute. But, you know, what's the age difference? The age difference is, is a, a, a huge deal. You know, if it's if it's curiosity, it's going to be they're going to be right around the same age, at least within two years, and it's going to happen once, maybe twice. You know, with abuse, it's going to be a, a bigger age difference. Uh, I think in, in one study, I think I mentioned in the book, you know, the average age is uh, of adolescent offenders or sibling offenders is 15, and the average age of a survivor is six. So, well, that's pretty clear, right? You know, in that kind of uh, differentiation. Um, you know, what, what's going on as they're doing it? Is they're giggling when there's touching? Uh, does the, the contact stop, excuse me, <clears throat> stop when it, when asked? Um, you know, and, and what, again, like what I said earlier, what's the motivation? Is it curiosity or is it sexual gratification? Well, if it's a 15 year old and a six year old, I mean, that, that's, you know, pretty clear as far as being able to recognize that. Other things that you, you look for is, is, is there, is there, you know, penetration is, is there oral sex, those kinds of things are going to be obviously, you know, abused in, in those kinds of cases. And there's a high level, as, as survivors know, of coercion, manipulation, um, those kinds of things, how kids feel about it, this culture of silence that's, you know, because there's so many of these behaviors from these offenders, that they really prey on the, the relationship, you know, between the siblings, you know, things like you need to keep quiet, um, you know, just those kinds of things that burden, you know, for, for a kid that to have to deal with um, the fear, you know, that, that's constantly there. That's why it, it, it's so, so traumatic. That's, you know, I didn't know that, that the average age of the um, child who abuses is 15 and the victim is six. You know, it sounds really logical too, if you were a parent or an adult and you walked in on that, and there was oral sex or penetration that, you know, six-year-olds don't have that level of sexual knowledge yet. Yeah. And it's to me that, you know, if you, if there's a child that's far too young 
to know about penetration or oral sex without being exposed to pornography or being introduced to it by another child or an adult, that that's a real, that's a, that, you know, that's a, that's a flag right there. Yeah. Yeah. And all those are red flags, you know, that, that we don't know, you know, typically, I mean, you don't know, I didn't know about necessarily what to look for, you know, prior to, to getting involved in, in this work, but those are just some, some, you know, right away red flags, you know, that you can look at, you know, when you talk about, you know, noticing uh, the behavior of, uh, of really either one, is there changes in behavior, you know, are they afraid to go around the other one, you know, and then there's all kinds of, of other, you know, uh, actions, you know, from, from survivors that, you know, experiencing abuse in, in other forms too, uh, but, but just really cluing into that for parents to really just kind of, you know, pay attention. But, you know, parents never, just never, never think about that, like in your family. We just wouldn't give it a second thought. And that's been my experience, you know, you know, kind of throughout, you know, and, uh, and, and you know, with the parents that, you know, in other people's work, um, you know, you just don't think, think about that. Yeah, I, I will say that I've had a lot of people reach out to me and they think, we just didn't even consider this. We didn't think about that. And, it, and I think it is hard for parents to wrap their head around to, to even think that that could occur in their home. So can you, for a parent who's listening to our discussion, hopefully, who is concerned about keeping their own children safe from sibling sexual abuse, what prevention strategies and tips would you share with them? Yeah, it's several. You know, I, th I think the first one to me is, is just really having a, a, a positive, open kind of relationship with your kids. It's like, can they come to you, you know, with, with anything? You know, do you know what's going on in their lives? You know, whether it's friends, you know, questions, you know, whatever that may be, you know, just really being clued in as, as much as you can to, to what's going on in their lives. You know, and then looking, you know, what are the changes in, the, in behavior? You know, you know, what's going on, you know, with, with them, you know, and, and, and really just, you know, trying to, to have those discussions, be supportive. You know, ask questions, kind of like what we talked about earlier. You know, it's just so important to ask questions, you know, those open-ended questions and give them a chance to, to respond on things. Uh, you know, we, we need to talk younger and younger, you know, than, than we ever have about sex, about healthy boundaries, about what's appropriate, about, you know, hey, we, we don't touch other people's privates, you know, and starting young and and, you know, it goes up depending on developmental level as kids grow, but really starting, you know, at, at a young age. And, and as we know, there's a lot of good stuff out there, you know, if, 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 as you talked about, Jane, you know, body safety and, and other things. I think those are all really important. But, you know, we just, you know, we have so many, you know, parents that, you know, aren't talking to their kids in meaningful ways until they're, you know, what, on average, I, I get different answers on, on this. And, different people I talk to, but, you know, 14, 15, 16, somewhere in that, that range. And they're, you know, when we talk about the offenders, you know, the average age they're, they're seeking out for for the first time is, is about 10. And so you, you think about that age gap and it's too late, you know, late. a lot of these guys. And, and, you know, they get caught up in porn and, and all the mess that, that goes with that. And the, that's such a factor in all this. And just really... Hey, knowing what, what my kids watch, knowing, you know, what they're doing on social media, what they're, what's, what websites are they looking at, you know, just really being involved in that kind of way. And that's no guarantee as we know, um, but, you know, you're, you're being proactive in, in taking all those, all those steps, but, um, you know, sibling sexual abuse happens in highly functional families and it happens in, in dysfunctional families. It happens in, in families that are white, black, Hispanic, Asian. I mean, it doesn't matter. Goes through across all uh, socioeconomic status. So, so this is a problem for all of us. May I may I ask you a follow up question on that? Yeah, of course. Do you do you think that it's on the rise right now, and do you think pornography could be contributing to the rise? I think I, yes, so, yes, I, I do. That's my impression. I don't have any numbers or research to back that up, but but that's my feeling. And I, absolutely, I think pornography and it, it, it is causing a rise, if it is a rise, but certainly pornography is a huge, huge issue with these kids. It puts them in a higher bracket, you know, with a, with a greater possibility to, to offend, you know, sexually. And so we, we see, you know, a lot of kids get 
you know, come into treatment with problems with pornography um, because that's where they're learning about sex. And, the, and the, they view porn and they don't have the, the life experiences like adults do <coughs> to be able to understand, you know, what's being displayed and, and that, that level. And they're going to, to try and act out these things that they see. Seems to me that, you know, pornography in so many areas leads to, you know, problems with education of, of kids because parents, as right. you mentioned, are, are not talking about boundaries and consent and sexuality until kids are far, you know, into pornography, or at least their friends are pointing them to it. So I think that talking about that link is so uh, important as it is with so many other forms of of sexual abuse. I want to I want to stick with the um, the youth who are yeah. Yeah. Um, and you touched on this a little bit. But <coughs> why did they do it? I know this is this is a loaded yeah. question. Why do they do it? And and what sort of help do they need? You know, I sometimes I hear people talking about youth who offend regardless of their age as predators, labeling them predators, yeah. monsters, or you know this really really intense language. How do you respond to that? Yeah, you know, they're a lot different than adults, okay? You know, and some of the, those, you know, things that, you know, are really are tied back to brain development. You know, the adult brain, as we know from the research, is fully developed at about 25. You know, kids, their brain development is developing. And, and so, you know, that you get them into treatment that they have, gosh, really high success rates, you know, insanely high success rates, but you got to get them into treatment. And a lot of that is they don't consider all the effects and ramifications of what they're doing. So you start teaching them about empathy, start teaching them about, hey, this is how, these are all the things that your little brother or sister or whoever, you know, whoever the, the child is that, that they offended on, you know, the, the things that they deal with and really teaching them about what, what goes on when, when people experience that kind of trauma. Some of these kids have experienced them, it themselves and so they have a unique perspective to be able to learn about that, you know, so, and, and a lot of it can just really hit them and, you know, where, where they kind of understand the impact and really seeing that, but they've never considered that before because they're so focused on, okay, I'm watching what I'm doing on in porn. I'm thinking, who could I have sex with that would let me do these things to them? Well, I can't think of anybody at school. Okay. And they're not, not necessarily to the risk level where they're going to go grab some girl in the bathroom, you know, take her in there and, and rape her or things like that. So they, they look and they're like, well, I've got a little brother or sister. You know, I know when mom goes downstairs to watch TV, seven o'clock every night, we go play video games. I'm going to start showing them porn and then I can get them, <coughs> excuse me, to engage in these activities with me. And so, and then you can use the relationship to compel silence i.e. the family, that you don't want to break up the family, nobody will believe you, physical threats, hey, they're, they're bigger, you know, if it's, a, if it's a brother who's nine years older than you, you're like, dang, you know, I mean, so those kinds of things, and, and you know, the, those all lead to this, this culture of silence, and, but the fact is, if you can get these kids into treatment, if it, if it can be discovered, um, and, and then move forward, you know, we see a lot of a lot of really positive results and changes that they're able to take place through treatment. I think a lot of it is tied back to brain development and really getting them to understand, you know, really what they've done and that ramification. And um, like I said, there's an important thing for, for treatment to do. And, and you're looking somewhere between 95 and 98 percent of kids that complete uh, a specialized sex offender treatment program. Um, aren't going to reoffend and, and come back into the system and in law enforcement those kinds of things. Um, so, so it's it's really high, um, you know. In, God, can in, I uh, interrupt for a second? Yeah. So you had ninety-five to ninety-eight percent of kids that get good treatment that's long enough. They finish the program that they are not going to reoffend or be charged with reoffending. Yeah. So that, that's based on a lot of research from James Whirling, who is amazing, and who I cite, you know, in my book. And yeah, and, and so that, that's what uh, the latest estimates. It's really, really high. 
that these guys will, will do very well. And you look at the flip side of that with adults, you know, that's more about containment. You know, it's harder. Um, and, and where you do see, you know, pedophiles and others being like, hey, it doesn't matter. I, I'm not going to be able to stop doing it because their brain is set. Their grooming patterns are set. And it, it's harder to make that change with kids. I mean, the adolescent brain is amazing. And, and you know, the ability with new information, with learning skills, uh, to be able to rewire itself and heal and, and you know, getting them off porn and, and a lot of these other things, teaching them about consent, teaching them about healthy sexuality, uh, teaching them you know, about meeting their needs in healthy ways. You know, those are all re really key aspects that, that contribute to that. May I ask an extra question, Suzanne? Go ahead. You've got the floor. So, Brad, when you were talking about, you know, they 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 become curious and they're they're wanting to figure out what what's go, what how to get their answers met, and they might seek out a younger sibling or a younger cousin. Generally, what I've read is that the the I don't want to call them predators, but the person who sexually abuses is generally a male. Would you say that it's usually a crime of opportunity so it doesn't matter if it's a sitter or a sister or a brother and and do older sisters sexually abuse younger siblings as well yeah that's great great questions um a lot of it is a matter of opportunity uh, yes I, I agree with that you know and, and there's plenty of people out that you know sibling sexual offenders that will identify as heterosexual and have you know and you know will offend on brothers uh, so does it, is it committed by, by uh, girls you know, as well? Absolutely. You're looking about 90, about 93% is committed, you know, by, by males. I think it's about 7% by females, but yes, it, it certainly happens. Wow. Why do you think, Brad, that that is such a, a, a disparate number? 63, I mean, sorry, 93 males and 7% females because the statistics around uh, sexual abuse as a whole, there, um, there are many more females that are abused. Yeah. Um, why, why do you think, do you think the research has been able to uncover the depth of the problem really completely? Or do you think that this is unique? This is a different type of sexual abuse. What do you think? No, I mean, those are, those are great questions. And, and I guess my first thought that comes to mind is we don't have male survivors of sibling sexual abuse coming forward to participate in research studies. It's a huge, huge problem in this. So we can't, and look, I mean, the research that out there, that's out there is really minimal. Um, we don't have much. And, and, you know, we need so much more on this to really get a truly accurate picture of how, of how prevalent this is going on. Um, and so perhaps if we had more males being able to participate, th those numbers would rise. Um, I, you know, I, I really don't know, you, you know, when it, when it comes to, you know, why the, the disparity, um, I certainly see it uh, among female offenders, um, but, uh, you know, I don't know why. So let's, um, if we could just back up actually um, for a moment, can you tell us more about what we know about the research? Uh, because I imagine you must have done a whole boatload of research writing your book. Um, yeah. I know when I started the incestorare.org website, you know, and I was working with some people to pull together research on incest, I was shocked about how little research was out there and how little of it happened after the early 1990s. There's just yeah. virtually nothing that, no, very, very few studies um, there have been done recently. So what do we know about things like prevalence rates, incidence rates? Um, can, can you give us a couple of data points for people who are wondering, yeah. like, really, how common is this? Like, is yeah. this a really big problem or is it a, a small problem? Yeah, it's, it's a really big problem. Rudd and Hershberg did, did a study in 1999 and they found that it's three to five times more common than, than father and daughter sexual abuse, you know, which you know, a lot of stuff that I read you know, talked about the feeling was that was the most common you know, form of abuse within the family. Um, so you have that. There's, there's a study that I mentioned that, again, is, is a little bit older, quite a bit older, but Bess and Jansen, um, some Australians, did a study of college students about interfamilial abuse 
and they found of the of the cases that they that they did um, in that study, I think it was fifty seven percent of all of the uh, abuse within the family was sibling sexual abuse. But again, low numbers, and uh, you know we just need so much more. But but those two studies really jumped out at me. Red Hersberg also talked about which I found was interesting, you know, just a, a high number of, of people that are, are survivors of sibling sexual abuse will have nothing to do with their siblings, you know, going forward in their lives. And, and you know, we, we definitely see that. But you're right, there just isn't a lot. There's a U.S. Department of Health study from 2002, again, talking about the prevalency of sibling sexual abuse compared to it with other uh, abuse within, within the family. Um, but, you know, not, not a whole lot. You know, we need more. And I know a lot of these researchers and professionals I've contacted and, and talked to, um, you know, just talk about, hey, we, we, we need it. You know, we need, we need this research. Um, I know there's a study in England. It's called the S Sibling Sexual Abuse Project. And I've been in contact with their project manager. But that, that's what she said. She, she just said, hey, look, you know, we're working on this and, and that'll be coming out. Um, I don't even know when it'll come out, hopefully in the next few months. But she's like, we, we don't have males to be able to participate in these studies. And, and that, that's a big problem. Wow, well, well, you have to let us know when that comes out because uh, we definitely wanna, wanna catch that. I mean, I, I could talk to you forever, Brad. Um, Jane, do you have any other questions or comments? I mean, you're in the thick of this too, Jane. You, know, you spend a lot of time thinking about this and talking about this. What's, what's your take? I, I do have one more question for you, and, and I am a huge fan, you know that. How common is it for parents to ignore this and think, oh, it's going to go away, it's just curiosity, and, and sweep it under the rug? Oh, oh, I don't have any numbers for you, Jane, you know, but it is a huge, huge, huge problem, you know, because, and, and, and I mean, think about it, and, you know, you know, I think about people going through this where, you know, it's not even acknowledged, you know, and, and you, we see this in other forms of abuse, but it, it becomes, you know, I think, I won't say more problematic, but, you know, we see victim blaming all the time, you know, even as kids, you know, things like, you know, parents, you know, you can't tell anybody about this, you know, let's keep it in the family, you know, we, we, you know what, what happens here stays here, just straight up denying it or, you know, this little girl, well, what were you doing in his room? Why were you wearing that? You know, you know, these kinds of questions. And, you know, there's this, I'm trying to think of a, uh, from a Walsh, from a Walsh to the study, and it was about adolescent sexual abuse. And she said that parents are more likely to doubt and blame their children when they're abused by another adolescent. So not just sibling abuse, but there is a higher level of doubt and blame. And then that's the worst thing that you can do in these kinds of situations. Because parents, like what you were talking about earlier, you just don't wanna believe what's happening. It's like, I, I don't wanna believe, like with your question, I don't wanna believe what I'm seeing. And, you know, it isn't, uh, hey, Johnny, don't do this ever again. You know, because they are gonna keep doing it. And sibling sexual abuse lasts, you know, for, for years, it lasts so much longer than, than other forms of abuse, particularly within the family. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, that's a huge problem where if you can go and, and react appropriately, you know, report the abuse, separate the abuser um, from the victim, allow, allow them to be able to get treatment, you know, you're in a much higher probability of the success rate of being able to bring them back together and, and you know, really address those, rehabilitate, uh, you know, the, the child. But yeah, that, that's the biggest thing that parents could take away. You, you gotta act and always believe, you know, um, um, the child that comes saying that, and then you investigate it. If something happens, then, then and it's not the case, you know, so be it. But as we know, you know, usually uh, it absolutely is the case, and it takes so much courage for these kids to come and disclose. And in a lot of cases, they're disclosing to other people besides their parents, but they do disclose because of that. Mm -hmm. That is Thank such a, that's such a good point. You know, one of my favorite prevention educators, uh, Feather Berkower, you know, often says that it's not on the kids to tell, it's on the adults to do the right thing, to ask and do the right thing and protect kids. That's, you know, and, and sometimes we, 
we forget about that or we don't we don't think like that. Yeah. Um, so as we as we wrap up, Brad, like where do you think we're going with this issue in terms of sibling sexual abuse prevention? Um, so if we fast forwarded, you know, 20 or 30 years from now, what do you think might be different? And how how do you think we're going to get there? Well, I, yeah, I tend to be optimistic, you know, because and I'm optimistic about uh, the movement with Me Too, you know, and, and you know what we've seen over, over the last, I don't know, you know, five, six, seven years, um, and, and you know, for years and years and years, we had sexual harassment, sexual abuse, you know, women constantly being abused, and nothing was ever ad addressed. With them. You know, you talk about what what's happening in the workplace, you know, all kinds of things. You know, and so we've come such a long way, I feel like, in that area. I am hopeful that we can move in that direction with sibling sexual abuse. We're certainly not there. Um, and, and, you know, we're not there. But I'm hopeful that, that things can improve in that kind of area. And, and um, you know, so different things need to happen, I think. You know, and, and Jane, you've talked about this. You know, and, and some of the things we've talked about is, you know, needing kind of a high-profile uh, you know, case that kind of grabs everybody's attention, um, you know, and, and I really don't know, you know, but I th we need to be, you know, talking about it, having these discussions, and I know groups and different people I talk to, everybody kind of feels the same way, and they just don't realize, you, you know, the, the level of the problem, but the people have their own stories, you know, within our circle, I think, you know, most of us can think of somebody, you know, and, and, but we don't talk about it and, and cluing into those discussions. And like I said, even writing the book, you know, people within my circle and extended circle, it's like told me about their stories that I never knew about, you know, but they would reach out to me and tell me, and, and, you know, we just need to create an environment. And this, this is all of us, you know, from politicians to, to, you know, all of us, I mean, every one of us, you know, really talking about it and having a national dialogue on this. Because this, this is an assault on our families, it's an assault on our kids, um, you know, and, and we owe it. We, we owe it to them to speak up and, and, and to protect them, and, um, get offenders treatment, you know, protect our kids. That's our first responsibility to these survivors. And, and we owe it to them. And if we'll talk about it, you know, really engage in it worldwide, you know, like what, you know, many people have said to me, it's like, hey, Brad, your book's mistitled, you know, it should be a worldwide epidemic. And, and that's true. And I agree with them because it, it cuts across all of us. And, and we just need to be talking about it because then people can feel safe to share their stories. And you got, you guys have asked me different questions. That I'm like, I really don't know. But you know who does? People, survivors, you know, the experience it. that's who I learn the most from. And, uh, you know, it, it helps me as a therapist in, in helping with, with others. And we need to hear those stories. Yes, and that's, that's really what Incest Aware is all about, is first and foremost, you know, really engaging survivors and talking about their experiences, but also being leaders. You know, I think Jane is yeah. an example of that, of somebody who has come forward and really become a real true leader on this issue. And um, I, I think that, we need to listen to survivors. You said this earlier, we need to believe survivors. We need to stop blaming victims. And these are, these are themes that came out in Me Too, but they need to be reinforced yeah. over and over and over again, because we still, as a country and as a world, like you said, are forgetting. But we are um, so grateful, Brad, that you, know, you came for this discussion. Um, if you're on the Zoom call live right now, stick around because we are gonna have a Q&A. Um, and if you are watching on YouTube or through some other form, thank you for caring about um, and learning about abuse prevention with us. We would love to hear from you uh, at incestaware.org. Thank you, Brad. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for your time.